I woke up to climate change this week, and I'll never be the same. I too woke up to climate change this week. I call it my climate change come to Jesus moment, and, uh, and I'll never be the same. I'm Connie Barlow. And I'm Michael Dowd. And we've been living on the road all over North America for the last 11 years. I think we've spoken to about 1,700 groups on science and inspiration and sustainability issues. So we're not new to the climate change topic, uh, global warming. Uh, we've known about it for years and been concerned about it. But there was a fundamental transformation that happened uh, over the course of the last week. And, um, and truly, I'll never be the same. Today's December 12th, 2012, and for the past couple of days, we'll talk about how we, how we got into it, and maybe you too will find your way into it if you haven't already. We'll give you some, some roadmaps in. Uh, but over the last three days or so, we've been completely occupied with learning more about climate change. We thought we'd known quite a bit about it. I mean, we're not climate deniers or anything, and in fact, one aspect of climate change I'm very well known in. But there was something that happened in 2012. Actually, it's a series of things that happened in 2012, and particularly October, November, December. And so for the first couple days, we were thinking, how could we have been unaware of this stuff? And then just this morning, I realized that oh, a lot of people are just waking up to this because there's a concatenation of events happening. And when it's in your face, when it's really in your face, then you understand. Yeah, I consider it the fundamental moral issue of my lifetime, actually. How we relate to the planet as a whole, the life systems, the chemistry of the planet, and our role in uh, ensuring either a hellish future for future generations or a viable living future for future generations. And that very much is in, in question right now. So for me, a part of it is that I've been so focused on sort of these long-term evolutionary trends, such as chaos catalyzing creativity, but I didn't allow into my gut my feelings. I just didn't, I just didn't really, I didn't let in the grief, the anguish. We can no longer just sort of go status quo. We've got to make some radical changes very fast, or we are literally condemning the future. And it, it is, it, it's a moral evil, I now see it as. And I was somewhat blinded to the immediacy and the, the dangers of climate change, partly because I've written four books in evolutionary ecology. I have, have a very deep time perspective. I'm always thinking of the paleo world. And so when you have that deep time perspective, you tend to think on geological time scales, not just thousands of years, but millions of years. And you know the catastrophes that planet Earth has been through, major mass extinctions, asteroid impacts, uh, glaciations, very warm times in the past as well. But I was really unaware of the immediacy. I thought it had something to do with, well, over the course of a century, sea level might go up a foot, you know? We've got a century. Slowly, this is going to be happening. And, and the, the subtropics are slowly moving north. And so I've been working with one endangered species and advocating for already beginning to moving it, given how much climate change has happened already. But sometimes it's the visuals. And so, Michael, talk about how, what was it, three days ago, you brought to my attention and you showed me a couple short videos and visuals put out by NOAA, the uh, Arctic Ice Report, the annual Arctic Report and so forth. How did you get on to this? What was, what was moving for you? Yeah, it was actually practically close to a week ago. I was just reading the Huffington Post, I think it was, and there was an article called uh, Five Things About Climate Change. Five, five charts. Five charts about climate, climate change, change that, should, that have, should have you very, very worried. And it was uh, actually published in the Atlantic magazine. Right, exactly. But I think I learned about it in the Huffington Post. And the, the, the fifth thing was a TED Talk, a TEDx talk by David Roberts called Climate Change Made Simple. And I watched it very early in the morning, and then I went in to tell you about it and watched it again and you know, brought us both to tears. And that's when I said to myself, I gotta, I gotta look into this. I, I just was unaware of how, uh, uh, of how easy it is to understand this and how compelling it is now that this is, a, that this is an issue of generational injustice. 
um, I call it intergenerational evil if we don't do anything, or if we simply allow the the oil companies and the vested interests uh, to uh, you know further a misinformation campaign so people think that it's not settled science when it actually is. So let's get to it. Michael and I are going to quickly show you the five charts that should have you too very very worried. And again, this was published in the November twenty fourth. 2012 issue of the Atlantic magazine. So here's how it was introduced in the Atlantic. Two major organizations released climate change reports this month warning of doom and gloom if we stick to our current course and fail to take more aggressive measures. A World Bank report imagines a world four degrees Celsius warmer the temperature predicted by centuries end, barring changes, and says it aims to shock people into action by sharing devastating scenarios of flood, famine, drought, and cyclones. Meanwhile, a report from the U.S. National Research Council, commissioned by the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and other intelligence agencies, says the consequences of climate change, rising sea levels, severe flooding, droughts, fires, and insect infestations, pose threats greater than those from terrorism, ranging from massive food shortages to a rise in armed conflicts. So these are two very non-liberal organizations who listened to the scientists and then decided what they felt was important. Again, this was the World Bank and the National Research Council. So Connie, let's show the charts. All right. Well, the first one had to do with the Greenland ice melting, and it was simply captioned, most of Greenland's top ice layer melted in four days. Now here's the pictures. Now it's important to know that it's not like that has never happened before. It has. But added to what was also going on in the Arctic, it just makes you go, what is happening here? So the second chart relates to America having its worst drought in the last 50 years. This past summer, the U.S. experienced its worst drought in more than half a century, severely reducing farm yields, livestock production, and raising food prices globally. The World Bank shared this snapshot of drought conditions covering some 63% of the contiguous U.S. on August 28, 2012. Serious droughts have hit the U.S. in the 1950s and the 1930s, with some areas experiencing worse drought than during the Dust Bowl. The reason we're not experiencing Dust Bowl conditions today is because we have better soil management practices. Studies suggest that we should expect severe and widespread droughts over the next few decades, if not longer, thanks to global warming. The caption for the third chart is, Coral Reefs Are Doomed. Here's what it said. Coral reefs, which protect against coastal flooding, storm surges, wave damage, and also provide homes for lots of fish, are doomed on our current course, says the World Bank. Coral reefs are dissolving because of ocean acidification. The more CO2 in the atmosphere, the more gets dissolved in the oceans. The illustration shows the impact on coral reefs at various CO2 levels. Coral reefs may stop growing as CO2 concentration levels approach 450 parts per million, which is expected over the coming decades. By the time the concentration reaches around 550 parts per million in the 2060s, coral reefs will start to dissolve. So 450 parts per million, 550 parts per million, uh, just as a, a point of reference, we are right now today at about 392 parts per million of carbon dioxide. And you may have heard about 350.org. That's a growing movement of people worldwide committed to doing everything we possibly can to bring, our, to bring it down to 350 parts per million. And we'll talk more about that later. So chart number four is wildfires are multiplying. In fact, we're talking to you from Colorado, where there have been massive wildfires last summer. They're expected to be this, this summer as well. In fact, right over there is Mount Blanca. We're on the lower slopes of Mount Blanca on the east side of the San Luis Valley at 8,000 feet. And it was right on the other side of there, Colorado Springs, where those terrible, terrible fires happened. Just last week, here on the land, we were doing fire mitigation. In fact, Connie was leading the charge. Yeah, in fact, this year and last year, uh, we've been staying in the winter for two, three, four months uh, here with 
friends of ours, John and Tyra Barnes, and um, they're in a subdivision here and semi-forested area of Pino and Juniper, some Ponderosa and so forth, kind of typical for the west slope of Mount Blanca. And last year,